Yeah, back on your home of champions, and we're going to be talking the UEFA Champions League match day one taking place on Tuesday. There were eight matches across the four groups, and let's have a look at those results. Newcastle back in the Champions League, a nil all draw away to AC Milan. PSG, Kylian Mbappe getting on the score sheet in their 2 0 win over Dortmund. RB Leipzig 3-1 over Young Boys. Manchester City, like they did against West Ham in the English Premier League at the weekend, had to come from a goal down to win. They eventually won it again 3-1 over Red Star Belgrade. Julian Alvarez in fabulous form, scoring twice. João Felix also on target twice as Barcelona beat Antwerp by five goals to nil. Porto 3-1 over Shakhtar Donetsk. Atletico Madrid held the lead until the 95th minute. But guess what? Lazio got an equalizer from their goalkeeper, Ivan Provedel, only the fourth goalkeeper in the history of the Champions League, to score a goal. And then Feyenoord getting the better of Celtic by two goals to nil. Let's zone in on what many are calling the group of death, Group F. And start with PSG hosting Borussia Dortmund at the Parc de Prince. Here are those highlights. Well, what a group this could be. What a great series of contests we have in store. Detinia, well, almost invited him to shoot there. Well, he got both goals. This is Dembele. And he's moved for the return from Hakimi. Oh, oh and the foul in there of the referee. And gets his goal. He's about to, to take the penalty. He looks at the goalkeeper all the way through. The goalkeeper goes the right way. Brilliant. Initially from Bettinia, it's the back heel, then it's the one-two. But look at this for quick feet. Knows exactly what he's doing, just cuts inside, and then just the outside of the boot that just glides it past the goalkeeper. But again, to have that composure at that moment in the game, this is brilliant. Defender sends him onto his... Yeah, there you have it. PSG winning that encounter by two goals to nil. One of our football correspondents, Simon Evans, joins us to have a look at groups F and G. And uh, we start with that group F. Simon, welcome to the Sportsmax Zone. I hope you're doing well. Very well, thanks. And you're all looking very smart in your new studio. Thank you very much. And you're looking pretty smart as well, like you usually are, Simon Evans. Um, let's start Group F. Let's start the Group of Death. Let's start with the PSG performance. 2-0 over Borussia Dortmund, the only win in the group today. Talk to me about the performance and the importance of getting out front early for this PSG team. Yeah, it is important because PSG have had, have had so many problems with the Champions League over the years. Uh, they ne they've never felt comfortable in the tournament. So this, was, this looked like a you know, potential banana skin for them at home to Dortmund. But they handled it pretty well. Uh, Mbappe w was busy throughout. And that finish there from Hakimi was, was absolutely wonderful. So they deserved the win overall. Uh, Dortmund were, were pretty resilient. But PSG looked like a team who should get out of that group. What were you most impressed with about this uh, PSG performance today? You know, they do start to look more of a team. You know, this has been the big debate with PSG for a long time when they had all the stars, they had Neymar and Messi, and yet it's, the team always seemed lopsided and there was no balance there. But when you only have that one real focal point in the team now, Mbappe, it, they look more like a normal football team, a good football team, rather than a, a, a sort of Harlem Globetrotters that they've become at times. Yeah, and Borussia Dortmund, uh, in terms of what you saw of them today, disappointed? Yeah, a little bit, but, I th you know, they're not the favourites in that game, are they? Yeah, um, yeah. So I don't think they'll be too downheartened by, by losing away to PSG. And when they look at that other game uh, in the group, I think, I think Dortmund will still think they've got a really good chance of getting out of that group. 
Yeah, for sure. Let's talk quickly about the other game in the group, Newcastle, um, taking on AC Milan. When you think about it, AC Milan, 25 shots, um, 14 of those coming in the first half. And many would look at that game, Simon, and say an opportunity missed for Milan to walk away with three points, given how much they dominated the game, um, definitely when it came to shooting towards goal. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Nick Pope, the Newcastle goalkeeper, had a great game, but they also fired a lot of shots straight at him as well. Uh, and he's a very good shot stopper, is Pope, but the finishing wasn't sharp enough from Milan. I mean, most of those chances actually came in the first 25, 30 minutes of the game. It was incredible. And they, they sort of ran out of steam a little bit, Milan, in the second half. And Newcastle almost, at the end, uh, sneaked it with uh, Longstaff, had a great shot that was just off target. Uh, which would have been very unfair on Milan, really. But it wasn't a good game, and that's why I was saying that overall, I think, I think when, when Borussia Dortmund start studying their film tomorrow, they'll watch that and think they're capable of getting out of this group. Yeah, and Eddie Howe speaking after the match in his post-match interview, Simon, he spoke about the fact that his team will continue to grow in this competition. We can't forget the fact that, you know, Newcastle, they have been away from the Champions League for 20 years approximately. So for him, he feels as if it was a good start, a good showing for his team because many of the players have not even played Champions League football ever. Well, yeah, that's one way of looking at it. I think that's Eddie being, being positive. I mean, it's looking so the result's good for them. I think they'd take that result before the game to go and get a draw at the San Siro, as you say, in their first game back in the competition after two decades. The performance wasn't great, and they haven't been great in the Premier League either. So there's something not quite right at Newcastle. I can't put my finger on what it is, and Eddie Howe clearly can't either. But they're not clicking in the way that they were in the second half of last season. So they need to get it together very quickly in the Champions League. But like you say, you know, coming into a different level of football, different environment, different atmosphere... That's not a bad result, but they could have easily lost that game 3 or 4 nil. Yeah, I have to say the play of the match for Newcastle had to go to Nick Pope. But I want to hear your assessment of Sandro Tonali uh, playing for Newcastle today. What did you make of him? Well, I thought in, 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 in patches he was really busy and influential. Almost everything Newcastle uh, tried to do on the break went through him. He's an excellent player. Um, but the, the, the parts just aren't together. Like I said, they're not clicking in the, in the, in the same way that they were last year. And, and, and so Tonali, a couple of times I saw him, you know, doing something really good on the ball, getting past a man, creating a little bit of space, and then there weren't the options there for him that he would have expected. Yeah, Simon, and we all love football, but there are stories sometimes that go with the football that are disturbing. There was a Newcastle um, fan who was stabbed Monday night um, in, in Milan, um, any, any details on that and how serious he may be because he was hospitalized, we're told? Yeah, the latest I heard uh, from, from the English news agencies was in a stable condition. So, so it sounds like that, that's going to be okay. But yeah, that is worrying. And there's too much of that in Italy. It's been going on for a long time. The knives around the streets of, of stadiums and in, in town centers where fans gather, um, it's really worrying. Yes, yeah, Simon, let's skip across to Group G, Manchester City uh, in this group, and they jump out front alongside RB Leipzig. Um, let's deal with the Manchester City performance, uh, first of all. A 27th match unbeaten at home in the UEFA Champions League. Um, only Bayern Munich and Barcelona have had longer runs unbeaten at home in the UEFA Champions League. So, yeah. um, uh, <laughs> Real quality being shown here from Manchester City, but they went behind again. They went behind again, but they responded really well. Yeah, they went behind, but they went behind having had created as many chances as we were talking that Milan had done against Newcastle. Very similar. Yeah. Uh, City had, had, a, had a lot of chances, could have been two or three uh, goals ahead, and then they got caught out with one on the counter attack. Uh, which, of course, then raises the nerves at half-time. They go in 1-0 down, and, and there's a little bit of concern around the ground. But they came out very quickly, got on level terms. Then it was uh, cruise control from then on, really. 
Yeah, you, you spoke about creating a number of chances. 37 um, <laughs> shots taken by Manchester City. So that tells you a, a story of what happened today. And Haaland didn't score. And Haaland didn't, didn't score. score. He assisted. And, and Red Star <laughs> Belgrade as well. They have pretty much become the whipping boys of the Champions League. They have conceded 19 goals and scored just one since their last win about four years ago. So it's been quite a struggle for them. I want to get your thoughts, though, Simon, on Julian Alvarez because he's been in spanking form both in the EPL. Now he brings that form into the Champions League. If he's not assisting, he is scoring and he is starting to become a real vital part of this Manchester City setup. Oh, absolutely. You know, and it's, it's going to be interesting to see how that develops. I watched him recently uh, playing for Argentina in the South American World Cup qualifiers, and they rested Messi against Bolivia because they were perfectly comfortable to play Bolivia with Alvarez up front. He's, he's grown from what we saw in the World Cup where we thought, oh, he's a good partner for Messi in attack. He's grown from that already in this short period of time. His touch for, for, for his goal where he, he goes around the goalkeeper, quick second touch, very few players can do that. He's so alert and alive. And Manchester City really have two of the best centre forwards in world football at the moment. And it's interesting to see Guardiola, who's always played with either one striker or no strikers, is now playing with two because he can't leave either of them out of the team. Yeah, and of course he loves the Champions League because the stats speak for themselves. 30 goals in 26 Champions League matches, Simon. I think we don't need to say anything more because the numbers, they speak for themselves. What are your thoughts, though, on the youngster, Jeremy Duku, coming in today, uh, Pep replacing uh, Bernardo Silva for him? He was good in the EPL on the weekend as well. What do you make of him? Yeah, I like him. I think he's a really interesting player because he's got... He's got a directness. You know, City's, City's wingers, like Grealish, when he plays there, he likes to take his time on the ball, to cut in, to move, he'll lay it off. Yeah. Doku is one of those wingers who will go at the fullback. He'll go right at the fullback and put him under pressure and make something happen. So they lost Riyad Mahrez. I think he's a really good replacement for Mahrez. Yeah, and Simon, I'm keen to get your, your views on pre-match uh, talk from Pep Guardiola that he thinks having won the Champions League finally last year, it may be easier for his team to, to, to win now that they've, they've you know, attained the level of, of championship success. Yeah, I mean, it, it was something that at City for several years was hanging over the club, that they'd won so much in the Premier League. We talked about it on this show. Guardiola was asked about it at so many press conferences. So I'm sure it's a relief for him to go into a Champions League campaign not being asked, when are you finally going to win this thing for Manchester City? And, and, and that, level of, uh, that level of relaxedness can give you uh, a composure that can go into the tournament where you, you don't feel that pressure and that nerve. So they went 1-0 behind today. There was no sense at all from what you picked up from the coverage in the, of the arena that there was a real nerves around the ground. There was a, just a belief that, right, we'll have to come from behind to win this. And I think, you know, City in Europe now believe that they can do it. And... You know what? I, I wouldn't be surprised if they did do it again. <laughs> RB Leipzig set to be their toughest challenge in this group, and they had a really good start, a 3-1 win over young boys. I guess you would have to say that is pretty much what would have been expected in this game. Yeah, I think so. When a Bundesliga team comes up against a team from the Swiss League, uh, you know, you, you expect, expect the Bundesliga side to come up on top. And RB Leipzig are another team who now... You know, a few years ago, we were talking about, oh, the Red Bull team, there's something new in the Champions League. They're so experienced in this now. This group of players as well, the club doesn't have a long history in it, but this group of players does, and, and, and they look pretty confident today. How good do you think they are, Simon? Do you think they have the quality to test Manchester City at all in this group? Because when you look at it, clearly, you don't expect young boys, and we saw what happened against Red Star Belgrade today, um, to be any real threat for this city setup, you know, I think they could they could trouble City in Leipzig because the way they play this this very energetic, high pressing game really does benefit from having a crowd behind you and being on a home field. And I think I think that could be something. But what we've seen with with Leipzig as well in the Champions League over the last two or three years is they do get caught out by the big teams. 
Um, they'll, they'll put in impressive wins like this one today, but then when they come up against the top, top quality, they just make too many mistakes, give the ball away too many times to really be one of those teams that's going to get into the last four of the competition. Yeah, well, Simon, it's only the first eight games of match day one in the new season of the UEFA Champions League. Uh, thank you very much for stopping by and for sure we'll be chatting a lot more throughout the course of the campaign as uh, we recap the many exciting matches that we expect in this competition. Have a good one. Have a good one, you too. All the best. All right, Simon Evans, one of our international football correspondents. We'll take a break on the Sportsmax Zone, but so much UEFA Champions League action to come, including that 5-0 victory for Barcelona with Jean-Felix scoring a couple of goals. We'll be back to discuss. With the UEFA Champions League, here's a reminder of the results from Tuesday. Okay, so we have no goals in that match between Milan and Newcastle, as we told you. PSG overcoming Dortmund, a 3-1 win for RB Leipzig against Young Boys. Manchester City coming from behind to secure three goals against Kervain Azevedo. Barcelona 5-0 against Antwerp. A 3-1 win for Porto against Shakhtar Donetsk. What about that match between Atletico Madrid and Lazio? One all between the teams. And Feyenoord, a 2-0 win over Celtic. Well, we're joined now by Brent Sancho to take us through Groups E and H. Brent, what an opener for today's Champions League matches. We're starting with Group E. Yeah, I'll tell you what, finally it's back. Champions League football and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it was an opener. Of course, uh, the, the talk of the, the group is that Atletico Madrid result with Lazio. Uh, another dogged performance uh, by Atletico Madrid. You know, Mari, I've seen uh, Atletico Madrid uh, be stubborn opponents to many teams uh, in Champions League football, but I've never seen them undone by a goalkeeper. And what, what an equaliser by, uh, by Lazio, of course, uh, goalkeeper Provadel. Uh, with the equalizer, but uh, a typical, typical Diego Simone performance by Atletico Madrid. But uh, more importantly, of course, Lazio coming away with uh, with a point from that, uh, a game that they dominated in possession, Lazio. Right. What would be the takeaway, though, for Atletico Madrid from today's match? Same as it is. I, I guess, they look, they, that's how they play. That's the football they play. They, they, they're, they're very defense-oriented team they, they drop a very low line of, of confrontation uh, they're extremely good in transition i was i was was impressed with morata up front and his mobility uh and they, they always look comfortable marshall at the back by that man at the, at the back there black who's who had a, another outstanding game uh they didn't really necessarily look troubled yes uh of course as i mentioned lazio had the lion's share of possession um but look i think the goal of course the fortuitous goal there uh, by Barrios for, for uh, Atletico Madrid, of, of course, give them the lead. But I think the goal that they conceded, Mariah, is uh, I don't think any of us could have dreamed it up or, or chalked it up. Uh, it was just an unreal goal by a goalkeeper lingering in the, in the half. I think he's the fourth goalkeeper in, in Champions League history to ever score in, in, in open play. Uh, but what a header by the goalkeeper. He, he's, he's, his header was better than a lot of strikers that I know but I won't call any name of those strikers. Yeah, for sure, Brent. And what's for certain is Group E had a lot of mouth-watering clashes. It had some really exciting action, and we saw one where a nine-man Celtic team lost to Feyenoord. Yeah, they lost to Feyenoord. They started brightly uh, under Ronda, uh, Brandon Rogers, uh, Celtic, of course, away from home. And then I, I just think it was a moment of madness and just absolute chaos in the second half. Uh, eventually, of course, being the undoing for Celtic. It, it's always going to be difficult for Celtic in this group. Uh, of course, Feyenoord was always favoured to win this uh, particular encounter uh, uh, with, uh, of course, the likes of Atletico Madrid and Lazio still in it. Albeit, of course, because of the tie between Atletico Madrid and Lazio, it still leaves uh, uh, Celtic within touching distance. Uh, of course, they're at the bottom of the group for now after one round of games. 
But from a Celtic perspective and an overall perspective, it is going to be very difficult for the men from Glasgow to come out of this group. Uh, and I think moving forward, they are going to have to try to get their points at home uh, where they're normally quite strong. Yeah, Brent, I wanted to get your, your thoughts on the Atletico Lazio game and the equaliser that came in the 95th minute, but more from the standpoint of how disappointed Atletico Madrid would be given that this was a game that they were pretty much on course to, to win um, and for most of it seemed as if this was a match they were going to win. Yeah, you know, Ricardo, it's, 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 when you think about Atletico Madrid, you think about resolute defending, you think about, of course, excellent at set plays, defending set plays, uh, of course, closing down people in the middle of the park, stifling defences. And then when you look at this, a goalkeeper goes into the box and scores. That is so anti-Atletico Madrid. Uh, if you showed this picture to any football fan around the world and said, guess the team that conceded this goal, I can bet you everything that I own and everything you own that at least 95% of the fans will not say it was Atletico Madrid conceding that goal because it's not like them. It certainly is. And especially at the time of the game that it was conceded. It's the last kick of the game. This is a team that is always fully concentrated and very, very difficult to beat. But I tell you what, what a moment of madness. This is what Champions League is made of uh, these sorts of nights. And... I'm very sure this is a story that will be told for years and years to come. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see Ricardo giving you the permission, Brent, to, to bet anything that he owns. Mm -hmm. I understand you betting everything you own, but uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if Ricardo would be in for that. But before we leave the Atletico Madrid story, remember in the middle of the last decade, they had been beaten finalists twice in the UEFA Champions League by Real Madrid. And towards the back end of the decade, we thought that the squad needed refresh, uh, to be refreshed and so on, to be potent and to be a, a strong European powerhouse. How do you think they have done on that front? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's still a, an ongoing conversation and Lance, I'm still there in terms of refreshing. And my refreshment, as I said about two years ago, starts with Diego Simone. Uh, I did say on this very program that I was there at the stadium about two years ago. And you know, you listen to the taxi drivers, the, 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 the concession people, and they're all saying that it does need a refresh. The upper management, however, is saying something completely different. But from where I sit and from what I've seen, you just feel that Diego Simone has taken this team as far as he can take them. Uh, and it's very difficult to disagree with that point. Uh, for them to get over the hump, you just feel that they need some fresh enough. But lads, I think if they brought someone in, it would change the identity of the team, the club, and maybe the way they play and some of the players they have. And the question is, will Atletico Madrid want to put out that sort of financial uh, outlay to do such uh, a, a change. Whenever anyone talks about finance and financial, I think about Barcelona and their financial issues. But today, Brent, uh, we leave that topic aside and we talk about that 5-0 win against Antwerp. Two goals coming from Felix, the Barcelona team ensuring that they keep a clean sheet. What a way to start this Champions League season. Mariah, unfortunately, I'm in several chat groups with Barcelona fans, and they're already talking about winning the Champions League. Typical Barcelona fans. They, they've had a great result in the weekend against a very poor Real Betis team, and of course, they overpowered uh, Antwerp today. Uh, but let me give credit where credit is due, and, and, and many in the show would know I am one of the big, biggest critics with Xavi, simply because I don't think he is championship ready, uh, a statement I've made several times, and I still believe that. However, I do, th I, I, I do think, however, that the performance on, on the weekend and the performance today would probably class for me one and two as Xavi's best performance as, as a manager. And a lot of it is down to the freedom and the tactical expression that João Felix had in both games. And I think he will be a pivotal factor to Barcelona's success. But before Barcelona fans go away, uh, of course, uh, with all this hope in their heart, remember, I'm pinning the hopes of Barcelona and Jao Felix, the most inconsistent footballer I've known for a very, very long time. So Brent, Barcelona have been eliminated in the group stages in the past two UEFA Champions League competitions. Do you see that same thing happening? And I have to ask you that based on how you started the narrative. <laughs> no, it's, I, I think this time around, I think they, they should be all right. Uh, I really do think so. Of course, when you look at the rest of the group, uh, they should be able to come out of it. 
Uh, but again, Mariah, I'm, I'm hinging uh, Barcelona success and someone that I just, you know, I think is a, a great talent, Jao Felix. Uh, and I, I would even throw uh, Cancelo in that as well, Jao Cancelo. But these players are very inconsistent. There's a reason why they've hopped around from club to club because they're just not able to give you a, a thorough season performance. Remember, at the end of the day, the Champions League is won in February and March. That's when the real business end comes up. Will Jao Felix still be counted in February or March? Again, if I was to put uh, Ricardo's uh, everything that he owns on this, I would say no. But clearly, you don't want much returns, um, Brent, because I really don't have a lot. I am a poor man trying to make an honest living. That's, that's all. And I don't bet, by the way, Brent. Um, maybe in the past I have made educated investments in sport, but I don't bet. That's why I'm using your money, because you, you don't bet, I'll use it for you. Right. But I want to talk, I don't want to speak about Ricardo's money that he claims that he doesn't have. I want to talk about Robert Lewandowski, because Brent, I have a lot of time for Barcelona, where La Liga is concerned, and I was happy on the weekend to see uh, Lewandowski getting his name on the score sheet. We all know it's no secret. He had a slow start to the La Liga campaign this season. He got his name on the score sheet again today. So are we getting some sort of consistency from him? Well, again, Mariah, and uh, I hate to say this, but it comes back to that man, Jao Felix. Remember a couple of weeks back before Felix signed with Barcelona and Lewandowski had a song by that, of course, expressed his frustration and almost cut in a, a lonely figure up front for Barcelona. All of a sudden, Jao Felix comes in the squad, a uh, 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 Cancelo who's allowed to of course go higher up the park and now he's he's getting that support he's getting that link up play uh, and he's getting to express himself and more importantly he's getting someone to supply him with the type of goals that he scored throughout his career uh, but again <laughs> all of this is relaxes on the shoulder of Jao Felix because if you look through that Barcelona squad one through uh, 22 there ain't no one that can play the type of role that Felix plays you know, within the squad, yes, they have role players that do different things. But as Yao Felix, with that killer pass, with that eye for a pass, they don't have it within their squad. And so for Lewandowski's success and that ability to play with someone and someone that can supply with it, again, rests on the shoulder of my good friend Yao Felix. Yeah, Brent Sancho, 10 seconds to answer this one. Um, match day one will be completed on Wednesday and I just wanted to get your thoughts about which game you are most excited about and be very careful how you answer that. No. Of course it's Manchester United my friend. Who else would it be? <laughs> what, what, why Brent? Why? Why, <laughs> why? why would you be looking forward to a team that is in 13th place in the EPL? Because of the fans. I, I, I love the fanfare. I'm a, I'm a big fan to see how you guys are doing. <laughs> But to be honest, Ricardo, I am, I'm curious to see if the continued, the, 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 what is happening now in Manchester United continues to happen. This is a massive game. You heard about locker room bust ups and all's going wrong. They go to Bayern Munich and get a result. All of a sudden, all is forgotten. So do let's you, see. Do you think Manchester United can get a result against Bayern Munich tomorrow? Stay tuned. Absolutely not. <laughs> That's, no, what That's, That's what I thought. That's what I thought, Brent. No, no, it's possible. I'll, I'll be honest. It's possible because Bayern Munich is not playing well as well. They're not playing particularly well, so it's a good time to play Bayern Munich. However, I have zero belief in Manchester United. Yeah, Brent, your first answer was the honest answer. That's fine. <laughs> Brent, that's okay. I'll save you. That's it for us for today. We will chat with you again, and I can't wait to be talking about that Manchester United result come tomorrow. So thank you so much for your time. Talk soon. All right, guys. All right, Brent Sancho there, our uh, Sportsmax football analyst. Let's take a quick break. Ricardo, can't wait for tomorrow.